You have a new short position in Manulife Financial, is that correct? That's correct, Eric. So this is a big company. Let's just be clear what we're talking about. This is a well-capitalized insurer with a $35 billion market cap. That's in U.S. dollars, $43 billion in revenue, $3.5 billion in annual profit. Why are you short? Well, Manulife just concluded a trial, and we expect a verdict by the end of this year that could have significant negative impact on its insurance subsidiary. So what's at issue here is that Manulife's insurance subsidiary might be forced to allow potentially billions of dollars of money to flow in uh, on 30 day, you know, 30 day money, so very short term money, and it might have to pay a 4% or even higher annual uh, yield on that. And this would cause significant losses to the uh, to the insurance subsidiary and you know would have, could create real problems for its capital so this is a binary outcome if manulife prevails at trial nothing changes if manulife loses and the plaintiff wins then it could be a very serious problem for manulife so that's why we're short i want to clear a couple of things up for everybody carson first of all your audience knows by virtue of experience that most of your shorts are based on a forensic thesis right that the company in question misstated its financials hid damaging information or perhaps even cooked its books you're not saying that this is effectively an event driven trade correct correct and there's no element of wrongdoing here the the one thing that, we that do I just, question that, I'm sorry I'm glad you mentioned that because that's really important to emphasize that you're not saying mm -hmm. as uh, unlike past positions that Manulife did anything wrong. That's correct. Now, there is a question whether Manulife should have disclosed this litigation because in the litigation itself, its own expert submitted a sworn affidavit in laying out how this could really become a parade of horribles for the company and it really could have material impact, but you know, this really looks to be more an issue of incompetence uh, from the 1990s, uh, some policies that were underwritten back then that nobody realized had this, you know, potentially had this major error in them, and they were also underwritten at a time when, you know, four percent guaranteed rate wasn't that attractive. I want to walk through me the mechanics of the situation again. It's important that people understand how it all works, Carson. An investor as I understand it, acquired an old Manulife insurance policy that paid a guarantee, this is what you're describing, parent, paid a guaranteed uh, return well above current market rates, interest rates. And the con right. this contract, in theory, allows the investor to put unlimited funds into the policy, meaning that Manulife could be on the hook, uh, sky's the limit, so to speak, and that Manulife has refused to honor the policy and the investor has sued the company to force it uh, to, to make good on the contract. Is that correct? That's correct. And again, we expect a decision by the end of the year. So basically, the investor is a limited partnership. It is set up as a hedge fund. If it wins, it's going to seek to raise significant money. And this could effectively make this hedge fund, if it wins, the, high, the highest yielding money market type product in the developed world. So what they would do is they would, they would raise money and they, get, they would stick it into this guaranteed interest rate account that is supposed to pay 4%. Now, when you look at the plain text of the insurance contract, they appear to be allowed to do this. There's no limitation on the amount of money they could put in. And the, there's actually express language that says, we will always honor this guaranteed rate. It's just nobody thought, hey, maybe somebody would try to stick billions of dollars in there in an environment in which interest rates are really low. But it actually gets worse for Manulife. There's a second argument that the plaintiffs are making that they're entitled to an annual 85 basis point or 0.85 bonus on the policy anniversary date. And that, the, it, you know, I mean, appears to be, look, it's not an outlandish claim based on our reading of the, of the contract. And so the plaintiff's view is that they could put the money in, they could put a huge amount of money in the day before the policy anniversary date, collect that. 85 basis point bonus and then redeem it 30 days later. And if they were to acquire multiple contracts, 
they could do get that 85 basis point bonus multiple times per year if they can acquire the same type of contract, which we understand is, is feasible. So these are two separate arguments here, that they're entitled to get 4% okay. A guaranteed rate on unlimited money and that they can clip an additional 85 basis points potentially multiple times per year. You describe in your report Carson which I've had a chance to read that the worst case scenario is a death spiral. You use that word death spiral that term for manual life. What do you mean by death spiral? Sure and to be clear that's derived from their own expert sworn affidavit. So what could happen is that this because when when they would put if if the plaintiff is able to put this money in Manulife because it's an insurance company it's highly regulated and it's very limited in what it's able to invest in. So there would be a negative carry there of some sort. And so that would immediately hit earnings. So Manulife would have to say okay the you know the net present value of this negative carry you know we estimate is x hit earnings that reduces capital. And so they would have to then they would have to then raise capital. And as the company, so that would of course potentially dilute MFC shareholders. But the other thing is as the credit rating gets pushed lower, then potential policyholders would say, well, you know what? I'm, I'm gonna go somewhere else for my life insurance. And to be clear, there are two other life insurance companies that could be implicated by the same set of issues, Industrial Alliance and uh, Bank of Montreal's uh, insurance subsidiary. Carson. They're all part of the same trial. But other life insurers, to our knowledge, don't have that issue. So when you're trying to figure out where, you know, where am I going to feel safest locking my money up for 30 years, potentially, you would go with a higher rated uh, with a higher rated firm. Carson, again, given that this is not based on forensic work that you've done, how confident can you be about a court case and an outcome that has yet to be rendered by a judge? So if this were in the US, we'd feel very good about the plaintiff's chances because you know, so let me just state we are not Canadian we are not Canadian attorneys. We have consulted Canadian counsel. But to our, view, to our mind, the plain text of the contract allows the plaintiffs, allows the hedge fund to do this and to get the 85 basis point bonus. Now, Canada, you guys do things a little bit differently there. It's not always up to the plain text of the, of the contract. There was a fairly recent Supreme Court decision called SATFA that might be applicable here. So we have a lower degree of confidence that the plaintiffs will prevail in, under Canadian law than we would under U.S. law. So look, we don't know, but the bottom line is it's pretty binary. If they prevail, this is going to be material for MFC, and this risk is not priced in to our view because we don't think investors know about this litigation.